Welcome to part two of the video series Control Design for this rotary pendulum in Julia. Today we will talk about how we interface this little device uh, through the C interface provided by Quanser. Uh, the rest of the videos, we are in video two. We're going to talk about system identification, stabilization control, swing up control, and finally sliding mode control. Uh, but for today's content, we dive straight into VS Code here. And uh, Quanser has released a, a hardware in the loop library that is written in C that is used to communicate with this device. And there is also a Python interface that we could call, but uh, since we can just call the C interface immediately without bothering with the Python, we will, we will do that. And to write Julia wrappers uh, for this C interface, we will may, uh, we'll make use of clang.jl, so that's a Julia package. And that will write all the wrappers for us automatically, actually. So I have a little script here uh, that was uh, written by my colleague, Rajiv. Uh, and we need to specify uh, the path uh, to this hardware in the loop uh, SDK. Uh, we also need to specify where we can find all the headers and then where we would like the automatically generated code to end up. And then we have some command line arguments that we pass to the compiler. And we specify some uh, options and then we call build. And this uh, is what will perform all the, the magic for us. And we said that we want the code in quanser bindings.jl. So if we have a look at that file, it looks like this. It's fairly long and we see that it has over 3000 uh, lines. But this is uh, essentially a Julia uh, wrapper of all the C code that was provided in the header files. So here we have Julia uh, versions of all the C types. So here is a type in C and that is the corresponding type in, in Julia. Here is a Julia struct that corresponds to a C struct and so on. And after we have all the types, uh, we have functions to access and set properties of these types. And then we get to all the uh, functions that are specified. So we have hardware in the loop open that opens up a connection to the device. Uh, we can set some options. We have uh, property enumerations that we have on the C side. And this is a corresponding Julia enumeration. And then we see we have a long list of methods here. So uh, read digital, write digital, for instance. And we see this would be extremely tedious to write uh, manually. So here is a call to the function C call, which is a built-in Julia feature. So we, this, uh, this Julia function will call the C function with this name provided in this uh, uh, shared object file. And here we specify the output type and all the input types, and then comes all the, the inputs here. All right, so we have uh, several of those functions that we certainly would not like to write uh, by hand. So I strongly recommend to use an automatic wrapper generation uh, generator for this. And once we have uh, the C code wrapped, uh, we can implement our, uh, our own little interface uh, to make it feel Julian when we call this. So to do that, we have a, a struct, a Julia struct called C backend that contains some uh, Julia vectors. Uh, for instance, here is a, a digital channel write. It's a vector of unsigned int 32. This is to specify which channel should I write to when I send commands to this little device. And we have a buffers for reading measurements. So when we read the encoder values here, there are two encoders. Uh, the C code wants us to provide a little buffer to store the result in, and we have those here. Then we have a function to check uh, the return type. Every time we call a C function, it answers with whether or not it succeeded. And if it failed, it gives us a, an indication of what failed. So this checks that and, and converts the result to, to uh, uh, this particular enum type so that we can understand what the error code means. Then we have a Julia function to measure, uh, just collect some measurements from the two encoders here. And uh, we first check if our little device has an encoder channel. And if it does, then we call the read encoder uh, in the C code and check the result and so on. All right.
The next step uh, we're going to go through today is uh, running control loops. Uh, so we're going to look at things like get a predictable timing. Uh, we typically want to say that we want to control this in 100 hertz. We want to control it in as close as possible to 100 hertz, not 101 or 99 or anything like that. And then we also want to minimize the time it takes between we read a measurement and we issue the control command. So to do this, I have a little uh, function here. It's just pseudo code. This doesn't actually do anything. And I call it run control naive. So this implements a typical control loop. It runs uh, forever. It starts by collecting a measurement, perhaps from this device. Then it uses the measurement to control uh, computer control signals. So this would be perhaps uh, calculating the PID, the output of a PID controller or LQR controller or something like that. Then maybe I update some states, uh, maybe I do some plotting or something like that. Uh, I send the control command to the device, so this will communicate with, through the hardware interface. And then I sleep here. So here I sleep um, um, 0 0.01 seconds. So this would run in 100 hertz, or at least I wish it would run in 100 hertz. But there is a reason I, I call this naive here, because there are some problems uh, with this code. So one uh, problem is that I have computed the control signal here. But then I do something potentially expensive and time consuming here. Uh, before I issue the control signal to the device. So that's obviously uh, not a good approach. I should have done it like this. So ideally I should uh, minimize the time between I get the measurement and then I send the control signal because if I have a large amount of time elapsing be between the two I have to model a time delay and that is certainly possible but if I can avoid it it's much better to avoid it and we get better performance. And then when I sleep here 0 0.01 seconds um, and then the total time for, for this loop is the time for the sleep plus the time it takes to actually do all of these computations. And if this is a PID controller, that's going to be negligible. But, uh, but perhaps if I do plotting and other things here, uh, then perhaps that time is not negligible. So then maybe instead of sleeping, uh, instead of this taking 0 0.01 seconds, it takes slightly more. So a better version of this uh, uh, control loop, I, I call it less naive here, is that uh, first of all I send the control command immediately when I have computed it but I also record the time uh, when I start each loop iteration and then before I sleep I compute the, the execution time so the time it took to execute all of these commands and then I subtract that execution time from the sleep time and if uh, this execution time now is longer than 0 0.01 seconds so this would be negative then we just don't sleep. Um, sleep with a negative argument is just no sleeping. But provided that this takes less than 0 0.01 seconds to compute, I now have ensured that I actually run this loop 100 times per second and not only 50 times per second. All right, that was it uh, for today's uh, little uh, video. In the next video, we're going to be looking at estimating model parameters for this system. All right, thank you.